Thanks for joining us, everybody. Um, I hope you all are doing well. And since it's 5.30, after 5.30, we're gonna go ahead and get started with our Healthy Homes webinar. Today, you're gonna hear from me, Sophia Mondos, the Sustainability Outreach Coordinator here at our Sarasota County UFIFIS Extension office, and also um, Carol and Maria, but I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, Maria, you want to go ahead and go? Yeah, I'm Maria Portelos Romito. I'm the Family and Consumer Sciences Agent uh, here at our UFIFIS Extension Office, and I work along with my two great colleagues here. But we teach a variety of, I teach a variety of classes, um, not only healthy homes, but also uh, food preservation, some disaster preparedness, closing up your Florida home, getting ready to launch that series. Um, as well as a lot of food safety classes. Carol? I am Carol White Evans, I'm chemicals and environment agent, but I do a lot of um, integrated pest management. So both in the landscaping and inside the home, I do um, insect identification. I work with same here, this, these two fabulous uh, ladies um, doing this presentation. I also work with Maria doing green cleaning. Um, I do the pesticide applicator training uh, for your commercial applicators. And um, I do, uh, uh, I have a Buggy World program as well. So um, kind of a little bit of, of everything, but really associated with or related to um, insects and chemicals and biorational pesticides. So glad you guys are all yes. here today. Yeah. And I didn't really mention what I do. Um, I do this class and a lot of our work in sustainability is mostly focused around energy and water conservation. We also have classes on a lot of other different sustainable technologies like solar, electric vehicles. Um, but yeah, a lot of our program is focused on energy and water. So with that, I will briefly introduce um, our office and our other programs that we have if you're ever interested. So Extension is a partnership between the University of Florida, Sarasota County and the USDA. We use university research and resources to address local needs through community initiatives, classes and outreach like we mentioned, and volunteer opportunities. So there's def a lot of different ways to plug in with us through a lot of different programs. So if you're ever curious how you can fit, um, just reach out to us. So today we're gonna cover um, what a healthy home is, energy efficiency, and your home health, indoor air quality, pests, and mold. And then throughout the webinar, I forgot to mention, if you have any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat box, which can be found on the Zoom menu bar on your screen. Um, and we will get to all of your questions at some point or another, either during the presentation or definitely at the end. So um, here are just a few main um, components of health just because I want to mention this, um, just because I mention your health a lot, like personal health in this presentation. So um, there's a lot of different things that go into it and these are just a few. So focusing more on healthy homes, um, a healthy home is maintained, accessible, dry, ventilated, um, pest-free, thermally controlled, safe, affordable, and I'm going to move my Zoom box so I can actually see my slide. Uh, clean, contaminant-free, and ventilated. And so to just introduce, um, so there's, those are, those are a lot of different components to what a healthy home is, and we're going to cover, um, touch on some of those, but the topic of a healthy home is pretty in-depth and there's a lot to it, but we're going to kind of skim the surface and cover a few specific topics. But just to introduce um, this subject matter, I wanted to start out with a little quiz question on how much time we think the average American spends indoors because our, um, our health is affected by how healthy our indoor environment is. And so it's also relevant to know and how that is, it's because we spend so much time indoors. And for Americans, that is about 90% of our time. And that is a pre-COVID statistic, which is still pretty significant. And so that's just significant to know, um, not just for our home um, and how our indoor environment quality is in our home, but also for other places we spend a lot of time in like schools and our office buildings. 
So I'll start by going over how energy efficiency and home health go hand in hand. So um, when we improve the energy efficiency in our home, we also um, in turn improve our indoor environment quality or our indoor home health. And then in turn, that also improves our own health. So here are just a few of the main um, components of what encompasses our indoor environment quality. So that's thermal conditions, um, and that refers to temperature and humidity in our home, noise level, lighting, and indoor air quality. So in energy efficiency measures can improve all of these elements of our indoor environment quality. And um, all these elements of indoor environment quality can have an effect on our health, happiness, productivity, well-being, and so on. So when we do energy efficiency measures in our home, it not only saves us money and it's good for the environment, but it's also good for our own health. So um, just jumping into a few tips that go along with those four categories. For thermal conditions, um, there are many ways that uh, the humidity and temperature can affect our health in our home. And just to name a few, it can impact your comfort, hydration, productivity, um, your lung health, and it can also cause mold if not regulated properly. And Maria will go into that more because that can also affect our health. And then to maintain good thermal conditions, um, you wanna also keep your temperature range between 70 to 77 degrees. And then for energy efficiency, try to keep it along the higher range of that if you can. Um, it just depends on your comfort and what is safe. And um, insulation and sealing up the air leaks in our home will also maintain proper thermal conditions in our home. And that also in turn are two very common and great energy efficiency measures. Um, sealing up the leaks refers to uh, weatherizing with weather stripping or caulking around doors and windows, wherever air can kind of leak in and out of your house. And then making sure your HVAC system is upgraded um, and maintained. Um, that'll also control your thermal conditions. And whenever you are switching out or upgrading, make sure you're always looking for Energy Star, not only on HVAC systems, but also your appliances. And then noise level in our homes um, can distract you from your work and impact your quality and quantity of sleep, which is not great for us. And to address those issues for indoor environment quality, you can improve it with proper material choices in your home, um, noise dampening materials, and also insulation helps with that. And those are also both energy efficiency measures. And indoor lighting is another indoor environment quality um, piece, and it can be easily controlled, so that's good news. And um, it can also affect our overall health because um, it can affect our mood and um, impact our eyes. So optimal lighting for us is if you can do natural lighting um, for vitamin D, and that'll also save you energy. And um, you want to make sure you're paying attention to the intensity of the light that you're using in whatever space you're in often, like for reading or um, wherever you're spending a lot of time. Um, warmer colors are easier on the eyes. And then also a tidbit blue light is not great for our vision and can affect our sleep. So you can consider blue light glasses or limiting your screen time before bed as much as possible. And um, also on the energy side, when you're picking out new bulbs, um, or not picking up new bulbs. If you still have incandescent bulbs, you should definitely consider switching to LED bulbs. They're a lot more affordable now and you can also get them in a warmer hue. And then lastly, here are some more energy efficiency tips that also go hand in hand with our indoor environment quality. So like I said, insulation and weatherization stabilizes our thermal conditions. Um, and then ventilation, you wanna help reduce the dampness as much as possible in our um, air, because that can impact your indoor air quality. And uh, a couple of tips for energy is keeping your ducts clean and leak free and changing our air filters. You wanna do that um, at least every three months and check it at least once a month. And then um, if you would like more tips besides the ones I mentioned today, um, we have, like I mentioned, uh, we do a lot of energy conservation 
uh, classes. We have one coming up, I think, either next week or the following week. And then we also have a training program for our volunteers to get really in-depth knowledge on energy and water efficiency. And I mentioned that because of like what I mentioned before, um, when you're learning energy efficiency, you're also in turn um, learning ways to improve your indoor environment quality and improve your own health. And lastly, we have a um, do-it-yourself energy and water audit kit available for checkout from any Sarasota County library. And that is a backpack that comes with um, simple at-home audit kit tools that you can use and a handbook that walks you through what you need to do to assess your energy and water use and helps you prioritize um, do-it-yourself projects to improve your energy and water uh, bills at home. And then lastly, I'm gonna just talk about that last component to indoor environment quality, which is our indoor air quality. <laughs> so indoor in air quality, like I said, is a part of indoor environment quality and it encompasses a lot and um, there's a lot that goes into it. So I'm just gonna briefly introduce it, um, but it can impact your health and um, some energy efficiency improvements can also improve some of these components of indoor air quality. Um, so some potential sources of indoor air pollution here are combustion pollutants, tobacco products, building materials and furnishings, um, cleaning hobby and personal products, HVAC and humidification devices, uh, excess moisture out in out different outdoor sources. So it's just good to be mindful of different air pollutants that are common in a home because all of these can affect your health in various ways and um, energy efficiency improvements can often help mitigate some of these here. And the health impacts that come from um, indoor air pollutants can either be experienced uh, right away, so short term or years later. So that's why it's good to be mindful of our indoor space because again, of how much time we spend inside. And lastly, I just wanted to mention, since we're on the topic of indoor air quality, is plants, because plants can be used as natural air purifiers indoors. And some plants are good specifically for different types of air pollutants. Um, and just to name a few, here are some examples of plants that do exactly that. So some of these will help pull out um, different um, pollutants like formaldehyde, um, carbon monoxide, or benzene, and there's several others. Um, and some of these are very easy to take care of and they look nice and they help uh, purify our air. And with that, I will pass it on to Carol to discuss pests. Okay, well, we get to talk about pests and home health now. So go ahead and that next slide, please. So, so um, why would insects come into our home? So insects, like all living organisms, need three things to survive. Um, they need food, they need water, and they need shelter. They come into our homes sometimes intentionally, but most of the time it's by accident. Um, but they are looking for either one or you know one or more of these these uh, three requirements. So if you take away any one of those needs, then you will successfully stop that infestation of those insects. So um, some insects can trigger asthma in people um, or they can cause allergic reactions. So one way they trigger reactions in people is due to their discarded molts. So molting is the process of that immature insect shedding its exoskeleton in order to grow. So that discarded molt stays around, which causes issues for especially people who have, who have asthma. And the second reason is that um, insects have this waxy coating on the outside of their bodies. And that helps to keep moisture inside, um, inside their bodies and stops them from drying out. But this can also cause uh, you know, problems for people. So uh, their presence is not just an annoyance. Um, they truly can be harmful to our health. Next slide, please. So um, how to stop insects from getting in the home? So um, through practical uh, pr practices such as prevention, pest proofing, sanitation, and if necessary, the use of low impact pesticides. Um, these are also called biorational pesticides. This will make the home less attractive to insects. Um, emphasis should always be placed on non-chemical practices, but when chemicals are necessary, um, it's really important to practice the smart use of these low impact pesticides when necessary. 
before you turn to conventional chemicals or um, to try to solve that problem. So you really wanna take a moment to think if you truly need um, to pull out that can of insecticide spray, right? Um, or is there a, a non-chemical way that you can solve that insect issue? So all these practices lead to improvements in pest control as well as indoor air quality and overall better living conditions. So not to mention <laughs> just a peace of mind knowing that you don't have six-legged critters living in the home with you, right? So next slide, please. <clears throat> so overall, how do we do that? Um, the answer is through this uh, a process called Integrated Pest Management or IPM. IPM is an environmentally sensitive approach to controlling pests that does not rely totally on pesticides. Pesticides are part of IPM, but they're not, they're not the first thing you go to, um, and they're, they're part of, of the, um, the methods. <clears throat> IPM utilizes methods that require, um, that, well, that reduce risk to human health as well as to the environment. You can use IPM anywhere and everywhere, in the home, in the landscape, in the garden. So IPM can be adjusted to fit just about any situation. So IPM looks at the entire system um, and thus it monitors the entire system. It does not single out um, only one problem. So for instance, um, you know, think about ants. If ants get into your home, they're not just coming in just to visit, right? They're coming in most likely to find either food or water. <clears throat> if you've left crumbs on the counter, um, the ants are going to be attracted to that. So eliminating that food source is great, but what's better is that you have to also look at how are they actually getting in. So you would address that issue as well. So you can use non-pesticide approaches to getting them out, removing the food source, and then using weather stripping on the windows, and then the ants are gone, right? So IPM doesn't rely on one single control method to take care of a problem. You need to look at it from a holistic viewpoint. So, um, but before you do anything, it's really important, utmost important, to do a proper pest identification before you do anything. Knowing which insects you are, insect you are dealing with, um, such as ants, there are many different species of ants and they have different feeding strategies and different behaviors. So knowing which insect you have and knowing some of the basic things about their behaviors will help you develop a successful IPM strategy. So when we talk about the IPM pyramid, remember the old food pyramid, pyramid where we had the um, <clears throat> prevention or, or the, the uh, vegetables were on the bottom right. You ate a lot of vegetables and you ate a little tiny bit of fat and uh, dairy. Well, that's the IPM pyramid as well. So you're going from the idea of everything you want to do is prevention and then up to intervention, right? So as you go up the, the pyramid, so you want to be proactive versus reactive. So prevention basically is exclusion, right? How to keep them outside, keeping them outside. Then you're going to go to your cultural, your sanitation methods. So this is basically keeping your, your home clean of, of, you know, clean and free of clutter. And then you're looking at physical and mechanical barriers. Those are things like, um, you know, insect traps, sticky traps, um, you know, uh, caulking and weather stripping around the windows and pipes. So those kind of uh, true physical barriers. And then when biological, this is both your, your, bio, your biorationals as well as your, your regular, your vinegars, right? Vinegar is a great product. Um, soap and oil, I mean, soap and water is great, um, you know, cleaning up. And then you want to get to your conventional chemicals. But again, those are at the very top of the pyramid, and that's the, the least amount of things that you want to use. So IPM does all of these things, but you want to do prevention is going to be your, your best option, right? Don't, don't get them in your house to begin with. Next slide, please. <laughs> Thanks. So what do you do outside the home? So insects can fit through tiny holes and cracks to get into your house. So sealing up those cracks um, with caulking. Also, if you put like, if you have larger holes, putting a screen mesh over any entry point. So things like your dryer vent, right? And uh, water, you know, your hose bibs, your, your water hose bib. Uh, also, um, insects love to climb um, trees, trees and shrubs that touch the house. So don't allow branches to touch the house. Plants that touch the house create things called insect highways. 
but it also allows moisture to stay on the home and then also causes other issues with uh, mold and, um, and rotting issues on the house. You'll also want to repair any ripped or torn windows, uh, window screens or your cage screens. This is gonna eliminate uh, quite a few of the, like the flying insects and some crawling insects as well. Um, don't allow piles or debris or basic outdoor clutter to be right around the home. Things like termites and spiders and other insects are gonna nest inside wood in those debris piles. So keep that stuff, at least always think like at least 20 feet away from your home um, is gonna be a, a good thing if you're gonna have to have those, those type of issues, those things around your house. Then also um, check for uh, leaky faucets like your hose bibs and irrigation heads. And also make sure when you have your, air, if, you, if you run irrigation, make sure those irrigation heads are faced away from the, the house. Don't allow them to hit the house because again, that's causing you know, a nice moist area for insects to get in. It will also cause some mold and some, some rotting issues on the house. So be careful with those. <clears throat> Next, please. Thanks. So what do you do inside the home? And again, these are just, this is just tidbits, right? This is kind of the, the carrot dangling in front of you. So um, to do inside the house, general cleaning and vacuuming is really important. The vacuum is your friend. Um, cleaning out clutter and cleaning up any potential food source in the kitchen. So crumbs, oil droplets, anything that it will attract insects. And just know that one drop of oil is a buffet for a cockroach. So, you know, you're cooking on this, the, the, the um, stove and you get those, those oil splatters that go against the wall and you don't really think about it. Well, that's a big attractant for cockroaches. Keep your pet food, flour, and other types of food that come in, you know, bags. Keep those in resealable containers. Those ones with the rubber gaskets uh, work best. Um, flour can also be kept in the refrigerator, um, but if you keep it in the pantry, Here's a tip, keep it on a lower shelf. The higher up the pantry, the warmer it's gonna be. Insects like to be where it's warm. So if you're keeping your flowers and your grains at the top of your pantry, you're more, more apt to have an insect issue. Um, taking your garbage out frequently, especially if you have a lot of food in it. Um, use garbage cleanse that have lids, especially lids that have the gasket so that you can close it. And if you collect scraps, like I have a compost outside, so I collect scraps for my compost. I keep that in a little, it looks like a little garbage can that sits on, on my counter, but it has a, a gasket on it and I take it out every night. So always just think about keeping anything covered. Um, sealing up your gaps and cracks where pipes enter the, the house, especially underneath like your sink in the kitchen, your bath and your laundry room. Um, if you move, remove that little silver plate where that the plumbing comes out of the wall, you'll see there's a much larger hole there. So in that respect, you may wanna seal that up with either steel wool or even a wire mesh. That's if you have rodents because the only thing that rodents cannot chew through is steel or, or metal. They, they can chew through everything else. Um, but you can also use things like, you know, if you don't have problems with, with mice or with rats, you can also use things like expanding foam or caulking if those holes are smaller. Um, but again, those are only going to work if you don't have if you don't have rodents. So um, check other areas, such as where like electrical lines um, enter your your home or the trim around your windows and your doors. Always making sure that those are are cocked really good, so that you're not going to get especially ants that come through those those little tiny cracks. And then with your attic, your attic should be dry and well ventilated. Um, it should not be musty. Insects love musty, moist areas, but you know, as we're talking about sustainability and keeping your, your home healthy, that must, you know, that must still, musty smell also means that there's a leak, right? So um, your, your attic should never smell musty. You need, you need to get, take care of that leak. Then check your plants, your bags, your boxes that you bring into the house. Check those for what we call hitchhikers. That would be bed bugs. You know, always inspect your luggage when you're coming back from a, from a trip. You know, I know recently we haven't had so much of that, but, but when you do, um, always check your, your luggage before you bring it into the house to make sure you don't have any, any bed bugs that have, you may have picked up at a, at a hotel. Um, do not leave pet food out overnight. So this attracts especially ants and cockroaches, but it also attracts quite a few other insects. Um, get rid of your cardboard. Okay, I'm, I'm a big 
I, I'm a cardboard person, but uh, <laughs> I should know better. Um, cardboard is where cockroaches hide and they, they have their nurseries. So if you take a piece of cardboard and you, you can pull it apart, well, that's where the cockroaches live, um, especially German cockroaches will live between those pieces of cardboard. So um, if you're gonna be storing anything like in your garage, it's better to store them in those like Rubbermaid type containers, anything plastic that has a, um, a, a, seal, you know, a lid that seals well on it. And then um, back to rodents, to keep rodents out, um, seal any cracks bigger than a quarter of an inch with steel, either steel wool or a steel mesh. So don't use plastic, um, you know, anything else, they're gonna be able to chew through it. And so if you haven't noticed with this, if you're pest proofing your house, it's pretty identical to many of the recommendations that um, you're also, we're also giving you for improving um, energy efficiency within the house. So sealing it up with, with caulking and weather stripping is a great thing. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so, I'm gonna end on pesticides. So I wanna just give a little thing on caution around pesticides. So for our own health, as well as the health of the environment, um, we really need to reconsider our dependence on, on chemicals. We can no longer afford to instantly turn to chemicals to solve every issue that, that comes up, even though there's a product for just about everything, you know, that's, that's an issue. Um, the average American has about 43 different pesticides in, in our bloodstream, um, which is quite alarming. Um, there has been widespread use of pesticides after World War II, and chemicals have seeped into about 90% of our streams and our rivers. So um, depending on the chemical, they can trigger anything from nausea to vomiting, headaches, and more serious concerns like lung damage, reproductive problems, as well as cancer. So pesticides are especially harmful to children. Um, because they, they're smaller, they spend time closer to the ground. Um, those small bodies makes that exposure to chemicals all that more harmful. So when they're exposed, um, their brains become more susceptible to, to neurological problems and can create um, long-term learning disabilities. So, um, and a statistic that everybody should, should think about before you turn to pesticide, right? When I talk about don't pick up that, that pesticide can until you really, really need it but approximately half of all pesticide poisonings um, are in children under the age of six. So this was just a quick overview of ways you can utilize integrated pest management, right? So that mainly prevention and your, your mechanical, your cultural practices um, to manage those insect problems in and around your home without the need for harsh chemicals. Next slide, please. And with that, this is just a, um, the reference list I had for this uh, uh, part of this presentation. If you wanna do a little bit deeper, deeper dive, we'll send this off to you. But I also have an urban IPM uh, program that I put on that is a, is a deep dive into exactly what I've been talking about. So thank you much, Maria. Thank you, Carol. I've been kicked off and kicked on several times. So I'm hoping that this time I will uh, stay on board with uh, our, my portion of the presentation. So now we're gonna kind of switch gears and we are going to start talking about mold. Next slide, please. So really, you know, mold has been on, the, on our earth for millions of years. Uh, it, it's part of our natural environment. It grows both indoors but and outdoors. And we really need to have grow, mold grow outdoors because it's a part of nature breaking down those dead organic matter such as fallen leaves and, and dead trees. So there is a reason why we have uh, mold on our on our earth and in our and sometimes even in our homes. But Indoor mold really should be avoided at all cost. Mold is a fungus that grows in these multicellular filaments. So if you're cleaning mold and you wipe it, you are just cleaning the top of the uh, mold filament. You're not able to get down into the root. And that's what makes mold removal just so incredibly difficult. But it can range in several colors from black, probably that's the most popular, but sometimes you'll see white mold growing on wood, uh, orange, green, and purple. 
and mold does uh, need moisture to survive and it loves to grow in the temperature range of 77 and 88 degrees, which if you are from Florida or you live in a warm environment, you are just, is the perfect place for mold to grow. And of course, mold needs that moisture level or that humidity. And if uh, that humidity is between 70 and 93%, you have beautiful living conditions for mold growth. So the goal inside our home is to keep our temperature at least 75 degrees or cooler. In the winter months, it's a little bit easier to do that. In the warmer months, of course, we might um, not want to keep our homes that cool. Uh, and our humidity level between 45 and 60 percent. You know, mold travels through these tiny little spores that just flow through the air. They're naked to our eye. And so that's what makes them so easy to uh, come into our home. But if your AC unit does not have a, um, a, a, a moisture or a humidity meter, uh, they are inexpensive to purchase and you can purchase those at many hardware stores um, anywhere between 10, 15 to maybe 50, $60, depending on uh, the um, make and model. Next slide, please. So there is a lot to be concerned about when we think about mold, because if it is left untreated in our homes over time, they can contribute to some health issues that cause some serious reactions. Now it can start out perhaps as a stuffy nose, a sore throat, coughing, wheezing, burning, uh, your eyes burning, even a skin rash. But if you suffer with asthma or you are allergic to mold, then you might, might have even more serious reactions. And individuals that are immune compromised or people with chronic lung disease can get lung infections from mold. And the Mayo Clinic did a study uh, several years ago and they discovered that most of the chronic, chronic sinus infections are due to molds in our environment. Next slide, please. So how does mold even come into my house? Well, I know I can't see it, but it does find its way in through open doors and windows and vents and in our heating and air conditioning systems. But we even carry it in on our clothing, our shoes, purses, bags, and even our little pets can bring in mold as well. Next slide. So, where does mold grow in my home? Well, anywhere there's moisture, remember that humidity level, but it also will grow around leaks in the roofs or windows or pipes. If your home has been flooded, uh, chances are you will start to see mold growth between 24 and 48 hours, but also in your bathrooms, like your shower, your tub, your kitchen area uh, around your sink or your stove but mold will grow really on anything that is organic. Next slide. So anything organic such as paper and cardboard, leather goods, we said like shoes and our purses, but clothing and linens and all of our bedding and think of how much money we place on some of those items. Ceiling tiles, wallpaper, insulation materials, drywall, carpet, rugs, fabrics, upholstery, dust, paints, wood, stuffed animals, uh, stuffed toys, and even those expensive decorative pillows can have mold begin to grow in them. Next slide. So how do I control growth, control mold growth in my home? Well, first, the best is to prevent it. I mean, you don't, once you start having mold in your home, the best thing to do is, is go for it and start treating it as soon as possible. But you also need to correct the conditions that are causing mold growth, like fixing those water leaks, condensation that might be occurring in your uh, sinks areas or your uh, bathroom areas. And of course, if your home has experienced any type of flooding 
but you need to control those humidity levels also inside your home. Repair any leaky roofs, windows and pipes, clean and dry after a flooding event, but just clean and dry as much as you can, even after a shower, cleaning and drying. And of course, ventilating whenever possible, your shower, your laundry room, any cooking areas. Um, if it is 55 degrees outside or cooler, opening up those windows and letting that fresh air in but keep moist or wet areas as clean and dry as possible. Next slide. So we said vent appliances that produce moisture, like our clothes dryers, make sure they're vented outside and clean those vents uh, every, every year, at least annually, uh, to make sure there's a good strong airflow and that your dryer is actually doing its job. Uh, if you uh, have, if it starts to clog and it's taking your towels twice as long to dry, then also you are uh, retaining more moisture in that line and in your in your dryer. So your uh, clothes dryer lines that extend outside should be cleaned out annually, but also your stoves and use those exhaust fans whenever you can. Use air conditioners or dehumidifiers when needed. And if you, um, you can always buy just a dehumidifier from uh, a big box store if you need. Uh, but again, those bathroom fans and open windows, uh, not just wind showering, but if, if it's cold and it's 55 degrees out, then when you're done showering and you're all dried and you've got your clothes back on, open that window and get that fresh air in and use those exhaust fans uh, whenever cooking. Even running your dishwasher uh, will produce uh, moisture. And if you hand wash your dishes and you've got hot water, you are also uh, producing some moisture. I have a little guy downstairs who um, is protecting the house right now, all 12 pounds of him. Next slide, please. So our bathroom, and, and this is a, a big place where, you know, we if, if we're going to start to see mold, usually it will be in our bathroom. And hopefully your bathroom doesn't look anywhere near or is in any condition as, as the one in this photograph. Um, be, bathrooms are difficult because we're showering in there where, where there's always running water in our bathroom. So increasing that ventilation by always operating the, um, the fan if you can open the window, but cleaning more frequently. So if you do see a little bit of mold beginning to come up in your grout or on, a, on the ceiling or on the wall, clean it as soon as possible. Clean and dry uh, is just the best preventative measure. Next slide, please. So some cleanup guidelines. First of all, if you have a serious problem in your home with mold, please consider hiring professionals to complete the job. Mold removal can be a serious a, a job in that you could be exposing yourself to a lot of those harmful chemicals. Um, they really, they are the professionals and they'll use uh, chemicals and they have uh oh, I think we lost her. They pop back in. Yeah, for just a sec. Give her a second. <laughs> Technology is great when it's great. <laughs> yeah. I can't even find my video boxes right now. <laughs> well, does anybody have any questions in the meantime for anything we've covered so far? <laughs> you can unmute if, you, if you'd like. There's only a few of us. I think she's trying to get back on. 
because she did disconnect. So Sophia, do you have any of your energy um, classes coming up that you know of? Yeah, um, I think we have, um, I know we have an energy upgrade. So the way that ours are called, they're called energy upgrade classes. And there's one, I know for a fact in February, I wanna say next week. Um, and it's at 5.30, I believe. Um, you can sign up for free on Eventbrite. And then that class comes with a free do-it-yourself energy and water um, starter kit. It comes with a few things to help you get started that you can um, install on your own at home, like some LED bulbs, some faucet aerators. Um, there is a smart power strip in there, a handbook from the Department of Energy and a few other small knickknacks that come in a tote bag. Um, but yeah, we have that coming up. Oh, here's Maria. <laughs> I told you my connection has been really bad. I'm going to keep my video off, um, but we're ready to, did, did I clear up this slide or should I go over it again? I think you're good. Okay. The next slide, please, before we, I don't want to get disconnected again. <laughs> um, so these tips, these tips and techniques for cleaning. Remember professional cleaning cleaners and remediators are gonna use methods that are not covered in this PowerPoint. And if you let mold linger on uh, any items like furniture or uh, fabrics like um, rugs, you know, you might not be able to restore those rugs or restore that furniture back to its um, original uh, beautiful appearance. So, uh, you know, you should try to get to it as soon as possible once you see that mold has begun to grow. Next slide, please. So more tips and techniques, you know, fixing those plumbing leaks as soon as possible, scrub mold, mold off of hard surfaces with some detergent and water, get a bucket and also use gloves and get a nice firm brush to, and some nice elbow grease. And uh, again, you can attack and you handle small jobs, but consider the professionals for those larger jobs. Next slide, please. Uh, things like this. This would be a huge job. And this you would want to just, you know, discard uh, the porous materials like those ceiling tiles and drywall and carpet and just throw those away, get rid of them. Uh, mold will fall, uh, grow and fill up all those little crevices and empty spaces. And it can be either difficult or impossible. And in this situation, it is impossible. Just remove the drywall and so forth. Next slide. And avoid exposing yourself and others to mold. So don't try to think, oh, I'll just buy some of that special paint and I'll paint over it or I'll caulk over those moldy surfaces. You really need to clean that mold up, dry those surfaces before you begin to paint. Otherwise you'll have a mess because that paint will begin to peel and the caulk that you've just put over the mold uh, will we will start to fall off and the mold underneath has just continued to grow. So you really have to clean and dry before you begin to paint or caulk. Next slide, please. Um, again, remember, if you're not sure how to clean an item or the item is expensive or holds sentimental value, you know, consult those specialists. Uh, consider using specialists for your furniture uh, restoration, paintings, art restoration, carpet, rugs, for any water damage. Um, and be sure that if you do use a professional that you verify their references, that they're going to, to do the completed job you want to have done. Uh, and look for specialists who are affi affiliated with those professional organizations. Like if you do have art that has mold on it, call up the Ringling Art Museum or your local art museum, find out who they use. They might not have somebody in house. Uh, they might be contracting other people or they can give you suggestions of some other good resources. Next slide, please. 
So what to wear? First of all, you want to, of course, avoid exposing, exposing yourselves and others to mold. So that N95 uh, mask that you are purchasing, you can also going to use them for any kind of uh, mold removal. Make sure that it fits tightly around your face. Avoid touching any mold or moldy items with your bare hands and always wear goggles. And goggles that don't have ventilation holes are really recommended because not only do you want to avoid getting mold spores, but if you're going to be working with any kind of a chemical uh, like bleach, you don't want to get bleach, work with bleach directly on your skin or get it near your eyes. Next slide, please. So wearing those long gloves to extend that extend up to that middle of the forearm. Uh, use water and mild detergent. Uh, ordinary rubber gloves can be used, but if you're going to use a disinfectant like a biocide, like chlorine bleach, or a very strong cleaning solution, you select gloves made from more natural rubber or polyurethane. And if you are, again, using that bleach, um, don't think you can make it stronger by adding ammonia. You will only create a toxic gas. But you also, when you use that chlorine bleach, wear eye protection and ventilate your area as much as possible. Next slide. Oh my. <laughs> uh, so usually I notice when we talk a lot about bleach, especially when we're talking about food safety, uh, a lot of people just pour bleach in and figure that's enough. They don't measure it out, but you don't need that much bleach to get the job done. It's really one cup of bleach per gallon of water or one part to 10 parts. And apply that solution to non-pore surfaces with mold growth. But and you might try to use a spray bottle or a bucket. If you do pour it in a spray bottle, make sure that you have it labeled properly and that that little spray bottle did not contain any other chemicals. So it should be a nice brand new spray bottle properly labeled. And whenever you are working with bleach, always test it in an area that is not seen, uh, like underneath or in a little corner. Uh, because it will whiten and it can damage. And if you are using bleach on your grout, it will eat your grout away. So be very careful using the correct proportions. Next slide, please. So here are some more gentler ways uh, to clean up mold. You can use borax, although borax, if swallowed, is dangerous. Um, but it can't. it is a good product to use uh, for cleaning up bleach and you, excuse me, cleaning up mold and you'd use it in the same proportions of one cup borax to one gallon of water. If you're using vinegar, always use white vinegar. You don't need a boutique type vinegar and always go for that 5% acidity. So you turn the bottle of vinegar around and usually somewhere on the label and smaller print, you will see 5%. And again, when you're using borax or vinegar, hydrogen peroxide, even detergent and baking soda, leave it on, give it time to work. It's not simply a spray on, wipe off. It's spray on, let it set, then take that nice firm brush and start working and cleaning it. Uh, tea tree oil does a nice job as well as grapefruit seed extract will also work. Um, and these products again are, uh, do some will create an odor, uh, but they are uh, less, um, less harmful. Next slide, please. So eight things to review what we just talked about. You know, there are potential health effects associated with mold exposure, including those not only allergic reactions, but even, even sore throats and headaches and so forth. There's no practical way to limit all mold and mold spores in our indoor environment. There's, we're bringing it in through the air every time we open a door. So if mold is a problem in your home, clean it up uh, and eliminate the source of moisture. Fix the source of a water problem or a leak to even prevent mold growth. Clean and dry any damp or wet building materials or furnishings within 24 or 48 hours to prevent 
continued mold growth. Next slide, please. Uh, reduce indoor humidity to decrease that mold growth. So vent those bathrooms and dryers, use your air conditioner or your dehumidifiers, increase ventilation, use your exhaust fans whenever you're cooking. Um, even if you're just, you know, have your, your tea kettle and you're um, making water for tea and the kettle starts to steam, still use your exhaust fan. Clean mold off of those hard surfaces with water and detergent. Use that strong brush to brush completely and make sure you dry it completely. Um, molds can be found almost anywhere. They can grow on virtually any substance, providing that there is moisture present. So the key issue is clean and dry. And I think that takes me to the end, Sophia. Yep, thanks, Maria. Um, so yeah, in review, we covered the elements of a healthy home, um, just briefly. I covered energy efficiency and how that goes in hand in hand with your home health. Um, I also touched on indoor air quality, and then we did a deeper dive into some indoor environment quality um, items like pests and mold. So um, again, the stuff is important to be aware of just because of how much time we do spend inside. And um, there are definitely links between our health and our indoor home health. And um, yeah, it's good to just be aware of our surroundings and try to keep it as healthy as possible because we do spend a lot of time indoors. Um, here are some resources of where we got a lot of our information from. And um, like I said, we just touched on healthy homes, the topic. Uh, there's a lot more to it um, for each component of a healthy home, like from that introduction slide I had in the beginning. And if you wanna learn more about um, healthy homes and all those different categories, you can check out these different uh, resources. And like we mentioned, you can also join a class because this is, like Carol said, the tip of the iceberg for these topics and stay connected and see what's coming up. Um, by checking out our social media, um, our YouTube page. If you ever missed a, webinar, missed a webinar, a lot of times the recordings are on there. You can request a speaker from our office for a group. Um, we also have websites and blogs and email lists for all the information you can think of. And here is our contact information for myself, Carol, and Maria. Thank you all for joining us this evening for our Healthy Homes webinar.